All right, Joy, why are we here? Where are we? We are at Simply Soulful, which is in the heartbeat of the Central District on 23rd and Jackson. It's a soul food restaurant owned by Lillian and her family, and they have been in the community for years making good food. Why are you running for council? Yeah, the uh, biggest thing is 39 years in the district. I've seen how public policy has impacted people and ensuring that we have public safety, uh, housing affordability, a response to our homelessness needs to get better, and infrastructure, our parks, our roads, just the basic infrastructure of government services. This is a district, though, that has had this kind of internal conflict for a while in the idea of, of housing versus gentrification, right? A lot of people want density in their, in their neighborhood, uh, want housing in this city, but others think that there's been too much in this district and it's pushed uh, the, the historic community out. Where do you stand in that pendulum back and forth? Yeah, and here's the thing. We've been hyper-focused on building a city, but literally our challenge is building a home. And when we're building a home, people have to get comfortable with density in addition to also doing it in a thoughtful way that doesn't displace people, people can be able to age in place, but also whether you're a renter or you're a homeowner, you're able to find affordability in our city. It's a delicate balance, and I think all neighborhoods, we all need to literally come together to figure out how we continue to grow as a city, uh, but it, it's gonna take some, some thoughtful uh, planning around that. What was this about the stranger came at you that you, you blocked some sort of housing development in 2017? Yeah, I didn't. I unfortunately had a developer who um, was in our yard and they were digging up our sewer line and they were trying to tap in instead of connecting to the city. And that's failed policies, which why are they trying to connect into our sewer line rather than going through the city uh, for utilities? And that's a, that's a big problem. That means that, you know, the cost, it takes a long time permitting. So we want to figure out how we ease that piece as well. Um, but also, you know, our community has been ravaged with uh, a lot of a lot of the um, you know, uh, developers in our neighborhood. Um, we welcome growth, but we also wanna make sure that it's shared amongst the city. You got into this race very early on before the incumbent, Shama Sawant, had even declared whether she was gonna run or not. Is there anything that people should read into that, that, that you decided to get in as early as you did, taking on uh, what is arguably the, the straw that stirs the drink in Seattle politics? Now, I don't know if people should read into that. I was literally planning on coming out in January. I think people are ready for a change. They're ready for someone to focus on local politics, local issues, solving you know, potholes and libraries, our local parks, um, and also someone that wants to be collaborative and listen to folks, I think is gonna be key. And you're saying that wasn't happening for the last decade in this district? I'm not saying it wasn't happening, but I think we can improve a lot better, Chris. Cannabis justice, I've seen, I've seen you described as a, a cannabis justice activist. What does that mean? Those, the, that's a, an interesting phrase to describe somebody. It's a title I didn't give myself, so I, I can't really explain what that is, but I know that I'm an entrepreneur with our family. I've done the last nine years of growing a successful business, and then I transitioned from that growing going into the nonprofit food sector and ensuring that people have access to food as well. So that's a title someone else gave me, but I know I'm just an entrepreneur and then I'm a food uh, access, um, you know, connector with resources, with communities as well. And you were in that uh, realm very early on, if I remember, an Anthony Bourdain documentary. I was, we had a great dinner on Mem Noon on Capitol Hill. We had a great dinner with him. It was the best dinner of our lifetime. It was a phenomenal experience. They also came to our farm and they highlighted our business with our family, which was the first time they've ever highlighted a cannabis business on Parts Unknown. So given the, the cannabis background, you know, there's this issue that a lot of people have been talking about in the city of Seattle. It now looks like it's, it's behind everyone, and that is the drug possession and consumption in public law. I think you're on record on this, uh, how you feel about it, but given your cannabis background, should people be allowed to, to smoke drugs in public outside businesses, parks, and schools? No, they, sh they should not. Um, I supported the council's decision uh, a couple weeks ago on voting, you know, yes to make that public drug use aligning with state law. I think it's very important that we keep our parks, our public spaces, our transit, you know, away from uh, fentanyl, which is, which is huge. 
um, and uh, want to see that implemented correctly throughout its lifetime so we can get people connected to treatment, reconnected back to their families, and get on a healthy path to a successful life. Weren't you against the original form of that bill, though? Yeah, um, I was at the beginning just because I wanted it to make sure that it had that diversion and treatment option. This new bill has that connected with funding, and I think it's something that we need to support uh, the, the city on, the mayor on, and align with our state law. You know, uh, I think I've seen that you're a big fan of tiny homes and building out more tiny homes. This is a district that, that has a few tiny home developments. So if, if that's something that if you're elected and you have the chance to, to create the legislation to build more of these and there's a lot of people who would like to, where do you put that in this district? Yeah, it's a good question. I, you know, you can think about places in District 3, but I also think about other places that could have them, whether it's uh, in our South End communities, uh, it could be some places in District 3. We've done a, we need to do a better job of emergency shelter options for people that are tr transitioning off the street, um, ensuring that they have shelter, uh, getting people off the street as quickly as possible, and that is shelter. We have to get them that shelter option first and then connected into resources, and then on the pathway to transitional and permanent supportive housing. RV lots, can it be done? I, I believe so, it can be, as long as we have you know, uh, public safety connected to that, as long as we have utilities uh, connected to that as well, where we have water, sewer, garbage pickup, and then we have public safety connected to that where they're safe and secure, like we see in our tiny homes, that can be an option um, as well. I've seen RVs parked on MLK for years though. I can tell you one anecdote. Uh, a couple of years ago, this, this city got funding for more RV lots. Durkin administration was in charge. I went to MLK where there was 50 different RVs parked inside of the road. Guy had a house across the street, proceeded to tell me he voted for Shama a couple of times, and he was sick of it. He was sick of having that outside his door. He's, he described himself as a socialist, but he was still upset that he had RVs parked outside his door and they weren't getting towed. So one, why isn't the city enforcing RVs parked at the side of the road in the 72 hour rule? Can you do anything about that if you're elected? Yeah, you know, that's working with our, uh, in conjunction with SDOT, our police department, we have to have more RV lots for people to go. Um, I don't believe that we should have places in which that potentially should be allowed. Uh, we have to keep those places open, um, but we have to have a place for people in RV or that are sleeping in their car, some place to go, and we can do that with more safe, secure lots. You can't just put all those people though in Soto. You, you cannot. Uh, this is going to take a team effort with the city and trying to figure out different ways, but it's a regional problem. It's not just city of Seattle. You know, there has to be other places within King County that can help uh, navigate and absorb some of those costs. That's why you have a regional homeless authority, you know, being able to attack it in a regional aspect, which is huge. But is that regional homeless authority working? It could work better, you know. Um, obviously, I know that, you know, um, when they first started, uh, Tiny Homes wasn't in their, you know, purview, wasn't in their uh, piece direction wise. Um, it could definitely work better, it can work more efficient, we can have a fiscal responsibility lens to ensure that we're meeting the measurable goals and that we are connecting people to resources. So it's not just, um, we know it, it's young, but it can get better. The mayor says he wants to continue to support it financially. If you're elected, would you want to continue to support that agency financially? Yeah, absolutely. As long as we have accountability, transparency, and measurable goals to ensure that we are meeting the goals uh, for people that are experiencing homelessness. We're not gonna end homelessness, but we can manage it a lot better. And if we have, we have to be very realistic about the management piece. So homelessness and crime, public safety, all of the issues that it seems like uh, are, are the, the top issues for people across the city. This district has had multiple shootings. I don't need to tell you this. There were multiple shootings across the street here in this intersection. What do you think that is a result of? A couple things. Look, I support the mayor's plan in increasing more police officers, retention, good police officers. Uh, the second piece is ensuring that our fire and EMT have the resources they need to respond, whether it's Health One, uh, places for people to go, landing zones after they get people connected to resources. The third piece is the prevention part. 
a lot of the activity going on in our city is, you know, youth. You know, our high school and middle school kids are, you know, caught up in some type of activity that we actually, that's a failure on us. So we need to have engagement, youth jobs, all these different things to ensure that they have something to do as well. Um, so it's our, our police, our fire, EMT, our gun violent prevention programs, all of this working in unison to ensure that we have safe streets. Is it realistic to think at this point that we're going to see any staffing levels, if you're elected, change at the Seattle Police Department? Because the incentives that the mayor has put out there, there's, there's not an immediate difference. Yeah, I'm willing to try, and I think the tone of the council needs to change. And uh, the, besides just the tone, um, also we can recruit from neighborhoods in which those officers can service in. Uh, we alleviate some of the priority one calls or two calls that they're going to so they can kind of go to the most important calls and the care team, the new uh, piece that the mayor has set up, that third piece of public safety, those can help alleviate some of the priority two and three calls that people are experiencing, the mental health crisis that we're seeing on our streets, and then our health one, having a landing place after our fire department connects to those people, a place for people to go. We have the outreach, we need landing zones for people. You know, homelessness and crime in some cases are interconnected. There was a high profile case a, a while back about an encampment at the side of the, the freeway that is in this district that had organized crime and an explosion. And it highlighted again the idea that those encampments along the freeway are not being regulated. People are not being not seeking services. Uh, should should the city, if you're elected, take a harder line with the state about managing those those encampments that are in the the right of way, the, the state right of way? Yeah, a absolutely. Those are regulated. We know by uh, the state, right? Um, and so, when we think of the homelessness umbrella, there's four pieces: there's a housing piece, there's a mental health piece, there is a substance disorder piece, and then there's a group of individuals that are preying on vulnerable people. And that's what we've seen on the side of the roads. That's what we saw on the side next to Harbor View. That's what we saw right off the Mercer Street exit. Those, you know, there's a certain demographic that are preying on vulnerable people. And that's a public safety issue. So if we can continue to spread apart the umbrella of people experiencing homelessness into different buckets to ensure that the right response for the right situation, I think we can manage it a lot better. But should those encampments at the side of the freeway given that they're in your district, should they exist? No, they should not. So you butt up against downtown. Your your opponent is a big transportation wonk. I, I think I'm, I'm not describing her incorrectly. She, she's part of the Transportation Choices Coalition. Um, this is uh, a neighborhood that a lot of people commute to downtown in. Big project on Madison. Talk about the Center City Connector. Uh, are you a fan of the Center City Connector and, and reconnecting everybody by streetcar? Uh, I'm not saying I'm not a fan. I know there's other priorities that we need to figure out in our city. Um, you know, I live right on the G Line, which is going to be a rapid ride, which is from Madison Park to downtown. Um, we also have that J Line that's connecting from through uh, East Lake as well. Uh, there are other priorities transportation-wise in which I think we can do a really great job at, uh, whether it's sidewalks, whether it's uh, micro transit. We need to do a better job of east to west operation in our city um, and also transit options for people to be able to go to the store or go to the senior center, different places where a lot of times, you know, those transit options are not available. It's micro transit options that we need to look at. I want to go back to policing for a second because this is likely Whoever's elected to the council is going to have to make a decision about the, the next guild contract. The guild is obviously uh, under criticism again because of the, the tape uh, involving the, the vice president of the guild making comments about a, a young woman that was hit by a cruiser. So this is all gonna come together potentially next year where there's gonna be open discussion in the council about a new guild contract. What do you need to see in that contract if you are elected? Yeah, a, a bunch of things. Uh, number one, we always talk about better accountability measures, uh, subpoena power, uh, ensuring that you know uh, officers are required to do some type of community service hours. What I'm hearing from community is, hey, we want to have relationships with officers. We want to know them before their badge. You know, them as the person. 
them understanding our neighborhood. And so to do that, you have to build relationships. That shouldn't be the community asking for that. That should be our uh, Seattle Police Department wanting, as they're doing, to reestablish a lot of those relationships in the community, which is gonna be huge as well. Um, and so it's, it's those pieces that I think are really, really important. And then asking people that are you know, in our community, what do you wanna see from policing? What does that look like to you? Is it beat cops? Is it understanding that you know, people are, we're recruiting in-house in our, in our city? What do you wanna see? And I think that's gonna be really important uh, for us to establish a contract with our officers. Do you trust the police department right now? Do you think people in this district trust the police department? Um, I think it's in the middle. Um, I personally, um, you know, if I call 911, I want someone to show up. Uh, and I know a lot of people do for their response times. Uh, they, want, they want that, you know, type of the right response to the right situation. Um, but I can say that that trust is being rebuilt as we go, establishing it with different police officers that I know and different captains and lieutenant. That has, that's gonna be a continuing build uh, as we restore the public safety in our city. What about the argument that there have been more shootings in this district in this last calendar year, even close to the East Precinct, because of the tone set by the city council, because of the lack of the police officers, that this district has been unfairly, uh, in terms of, of cases, has seen an unfair amount of cases because there aren't as many police now in this district? Yeah, I think when people think of uh, police, they think of the officer that you see that comes after you dial 911 or the ones you see driving. But there's a large amount of the department behind the scenes that do a lot of the detective work, that do a lot of the gun violence prevention work, that might keep guns off the streets. They're also doing solving crimes, solving murders that we don't see every day to day. I know that's where we're lacking significantly. Um, and so, um, you know, with our community, we've been riddled with gun violence. The South End has been riddled with gun violence. Public safety affects us, where you're gonna park your car, what time you're going to the store, all these different pieces, subconsciously and non-subconsciously. And so, um, you know, I think people want a response, a quick response. They also wanna see more of that in our community, but they also want the preventative as well. So it's, it's a definitely a balance. So how do you add, uh, especially when the mayor who is supporting you, has endorsed you, is suggesting that there's going to be a fiscal cliff in 2025? How do you how do you add police departments how, or police officers? How do you add resources in this city to make it safer? Yeah, I think right now, you know, you think about progressive revenue. We've talked about that. Uh, we've also talked about like, can we look at our budget to see if we can be more efficient as well? I know we have a bunch of open positions right now with our police department that we have not filled yet. Um, and so I think that's the first tackle is like, hey, how can we fill these positions? Um, and I think the second piece is, can we look at different progressive revenues uh, for our city um, as well? But I think the first piece is for us to understand what the budget looks like. How are we spending it? How, how can we improve it? Are there efficiencies that we need to do better? And then how are we gonna establish uh, more revenue for our city? You know, we've sat here and you've never raised your voice. And in city council chambers, sometimes people raise their voices and, and verbally attack whoever is on the dais. Are you, are you sure you're ready for that, for that mix uh, on, a, on a weekly basis? Hey, well, I'm gonna tell you this, Chris. I played basketball at the highest level. I had fans screaming at me all the time, crazy stuff. I had to always remain confident, cool, collected. That's what's going to take the importance where if you're a leader and you're in a leadership position, you have to have that demeanor, that tone, that confidence to ensure that people understand what you're saying and they also understand that they trust you. That's going to be huge. And so I'm ready for, for that uh, if the opportunity presents itself and looking forward to it. Well, Joy, thanks for sitting down with me. It's Simply Soulful. Simply Soulful. Thank you, Chris.